Uh, this one will do. There I was thinking I'd have to introduce myself. Thank you very much, Sam. And uh, yeah, also, thank you very much, Sam, for bringing uh, OWASP back to, back to Thought Machine. So we hosted uh, two of these last year, one in uh, September, one in uh, December, which were much less well attended than this one. Good to see you all. Uh, and uh, yeah, we enjoyed doing that and we're happy to do it again. And hopefully everything goes well this evening and we'll keep doing this for the foreseeable future. Uh, and yes, also congratulations on your, uh, your election to the, glo the global board. Thank you. Right. Uh, oh yeah, uh, you all will have noticed on, based on the banner of the event and also from the thing that uh, Sam just used to introduce me, the photo I have as my current LinkedIn profile, it was taken in 2019. It is old. I look like a child in it. Please, someone take a decent photo of me this evening. All right. Without further ado. So yeah, this is, this is me. I was going to talk about who I am, but it doesn't seem necessary now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a word about uh, the company that I currently work for, Thought Machine. Uh, we... Uh, do core banking in the cloud. We are a cloud native uh, organization. We run uh, essentially a big old database uh, on massive Kubernetes clusters that serves as uh, a bank as a service. Uh, and I work within uh, the threat operations team within, uh, within Thought Machine. We run a detection and response operation that is responsible for our, uh, for our corporate assets, our CICD, our Cloud Emperor, of course, but most notably and most fun, uh, real money transactions moving over our workloads in Kubernetes in our uh, banking operations for our SaaS clients. Uh, the kinds of log sources we deal with are listed there. We, we have uh, all of our Macs, all of our, uh, all of our Kubernetes API events, all of our Cloud API events and many, many more that I will try not to divulge on a call that is recorded. Uh, yeah, that'll do for that. Uh, so let's do a little scoping for the talk that I'm about to give, because uh, you know you can do something arbitrarily massive when you're talking about something like detection and response. Uh, so our motivation is the same as any team running a detection and response operation. We want to maximize true positives and minimize the false positives and false negatives when it comes to the detection and the response aspect. Uh, so if you're a SOC analyst or you've ever been one, uh, then you know these will be familiar to you. Uh, seeing fewer of these is probably what you would consider to be a, a strong metric of success. Uh, yeah, we're not here to talk about those. <laughs> um, we are mostly here. So the scope of this talk is mostly concerned with, uh, with false negatives and the rate of false negatives, which is to say, uh, the events that occurred and you didn't see, or, well, you didn't alert on. Uh, seeing that figure fall is the way to be confident that you have an effective detection operation. So there are two major angles you could approach this objective from. Uh, one is coverage, so making sure you have lots of detections. Uh, and the other is making sure that the detections that you do have work, i.e. reliability engineering. Uh, so that's our scope, um, specifically the reliability engineering half. We're not going to talk about the, uh, the coverage half. The coverage half is like yeah, something else. Uh, so to those who've ever had the fun task of uh, architecting a detection uh, architecture, you'll recognize this for what it is, which is the, the full journey of a, all the way from an event occurring, whatever it may have been, to an alert being generated. Uh, the point of putting it on a slide in this fashion is to illustrate how long it is. And like th this, yeah. And, and only one step on this needs to fail in order for a suspicious event to not generate an alert. And to make matters worse, uh, this is, for, for, again, for anyone who has ever architected a large and you know, scaled uh, logging architecture, uh, you'll know that this is a simplification, a, a gross simplification. For instance, that, uh, that log parsing step there with the vector or file beat or log stash, or, you know, whatever your choice uh, log parsing, log shipping tool is. Uh, I mean, to suggest that that happens only once is wishful in the extreme. Uh, 
many of these steps are probably repeated and interlinked. So reliability engineering for this is quite difficult. So we write tests, but do you feel confident that you could test every single item on there? You would want to, you would aim to, but do you feel confident that you have? When a pipeline gets this long, it warrants end-to-end -end testing, uh, which is you know, the motivation of the talk I'm doing, giving. Uh, yeah. Trouble is, uh, in the domain of detection engineering, I'm not really aware of a standardized approach to uh, detection testing, end-to-end -to -end detection testing, that is. Uh, there are notions, that, there are tools that come close, but not quite. So uh, what does an end-to-end -end test look like for a detection? So this is the question that was on my mind when uh, uh, stuck on a flight with no internet, uh, flying back from a short holiday. And like throughout the course of that flight, I, I basically came up with this wheel while I was there. I was like, okay, we need, we need, a, we need a binary that's gonna, that's gonna trigger a synthetic suspicious event. It's, it's gonna be like something interesting, something like a, a spicy looking AWS API call. It's gonna be the, the, the call to uh, encrypt your, your data, to alter your KMS keys, which is like a dead giveaway of ransomware or something like that. Uh, okay, you're gonna trigger that event and then you start polling your seam. And if you find the alert, then uh, in, in whatever index you'll, uh, you're keeping your alerts in, then cool, great. Close the alert and report everything in like a JSON blob at the end. Uh, and whenever you find failures, uh, run, run this as a cron job, run this every night. Why, why wouldn't you run it as often as you like? Uh, and whenever you encounter failures, use those failures to drive a change and improvement. Got off this flight, messaged uh, the gentleman uh, to, to my left, Marco, and said, Marco, like, this is, I've, I've had this fantastic idea. And he was like, buddy. Uh, <laughs> as with every great idea I've ever had, it has, of course, been done. Uh, and the guys to do it were uh, a group called, uh, well, <laughs> the, the guys who run the SIEM uh, Datadog. Uh, and they called it Threat Test. Um, it's, it's pretty neat. It does exactly what I just said. Uh, the only nuance that I didn't pick up on when I was on my flight, and also, uh, but but these guys did work out and did address during the process of what they were doing, is that you need to be quite clever on the question of making sure that you close the right alert. The way to do that is to inject a uh, a UUID, a uni universally unique identifier. You've got to find some way when you trigger the event to get that into the log that is generated and subsequently into the alert that is raised. And that makes it possible to certainly uniquely identify the alert that was raised and therefore know that you are closing exactly the right one. Because the worst thing this could do is go, go rogue and uh, close all of your alerts or close none of them. Uh, yeah, so the threat test binary works exactly as I, uh, as I said, it has this set of uh, so-called detonators, which serve to trigger the uh, suspicious events, uh, synthetic suspicious events that I mentioned in this slide. Uh, and as for the search for it in the seam aspect, that's also modular, uh, and that's handled by something called uh, matches. Uh, so as it exists at the moment, Threat Test has a matcher for the Datadog seam, funny that. Uh, and it has detonators associated with uh, running commands on your own machine, running commands executed over SSH, uh, making AWS API calls, and something called Stratus Red Team, which is this uh, excellent little suite of tools that will do something called atomic red teaming, which is uh, setting off precise, discrete, uh, suspicious events. Uh, of course, when I discovered this uh, after Marco uh, burst my bubble, I was like, Okay, well, I mean, that's fine. Like, we've we've got some well, we've got some work to do to implement this. Then like, we can put this in our in our seam. Like, this sounds like something we should have. Uh, yeah, there's a problem. We don't use Datadog. <laughs> um, we we are an Elasticsearch house. We're ELK people all the way down, uh, for better or worse. Uh, so if I want to use a uh, Datadog, uh, sorry, if I want to use Threat Test, then I need to write a new matcher. Uh, so this matcher needs to be capable of querying Elasticsearch for alerts. It needs to be able to hit the, the index in which uh, alerts are stored. It needs to validate whether any of them contain this, uh, this UUID, which, I've been which I mentioned. 
and yeah, they're there, pass the test, and automatically close the alert. So reach out to the uh, detections and alerting API. So to give some of this a little bit of uh, a little bit of flavor, this is what uh, one of these would actually look like. This is how it would actually manifest. Uh, these things are arranged into the so-called uh, scenarios. A scenario uh, can be defined as a YAML document, and this will contain uh, uh, a detonator and and quote quote unquote expectation, which in which within which in, in which you will find your uh, your chosen matcher. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a reasonably self-explanatory slide, I think. <laughs> right, so. Uh, and this is uh, some sample output taken from uh, uh, straight from the the readme of uh, a threat test. Uh, this is what you would see. Uh, this is what you get, and this is what uh, failure looks like. Note the third one is uh, is actually a failure. Uh, a non-failure. Okay, cool, fine. Uh, you know, at some point it failed. It, this does the the scope of this tool is not to tell you what failed. It's just to tell you that something failed. It is up to you still to go and investigate. Yeah. So uh, that is really all I had to talk about because uh, I'm afraid this is just a lightning talk. If I had done more work, then this would this could be a full length talk. But I haven't. So there we are. Uh, so future work is to productionize this, get my uh, get my currently outstanding uh, pull request uh, merged in uh, with the with the consent of uh, the guys maintaining the threat test repository. Uh, look into the prospect of additional detonators. So currently there aren't. So while while you can. Um, uh, so courtesy of the local command execution and the shell commands executed by, SS, by their SSH, sure, you can, you can execute arbitrary suspicious events uh, courtesy of that. You could make calls out to the AWS API or to uh, you could make kubectl calls from there if you wanted. But it's not that smooth an experience. It's not that nice. Uh, so it would be very nice if we had uh, some Kubernetes detonations built into it because Kubernetes is very much what we do. The HTTP request bit, um, the HTTP request bit there, uh, concerns uh, again better integrations for making arbitrary uh, HTTP requests to uh, to web server endpoints, uh, simply because this is uh, how quite a few ex services around uh, around our organization may well be exposed, and that is potentially the kind of suspicious event we'd like to be able to generate. Uh, the other aspect is though we're not going to drive this. We would also love to see, uh, much as the guys at uh, Datadog were open to seeing uh, new matches uh, into, introduced, we would also love to see uh, more organizations introducing new matches, the obvious candidates being uh, Splunk, uh, Sumo Logic, and uh, someone I know mentioned Greylog. So that's how that got into there. Uh, and just to make it a little bit more user-friendly, the current uh, repository has uh, got a bit of a steep learning curve associated with it. It would be good to see some scenario starter packs so you could uh, deploy this fairly swiftly out of the, out of the box. Uh, and, the most, and the final item of future work is more of a culture thing uh, for, for our organization, which is to see an experiment take place where we truly do test-driven development for detection engineering, which is to say we don't start with uh, an idea of a detection or an alert. We start by writing a threat test scenario. We run it, it fails, and then we don't stop. We don't consider our work to be done for that week or for at least on that detection until that test is passing. Truly test-driven development. All right, that's, that's all I had. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions? Yeah, we have one from Prabhu. Thank you. This is very uh, ins inspirational. Actually, I will go uh, uh, check out Threat Test. Um, I have some experience doing these sort of things manually. Like, like these are um, kind of known things. Like you test the testers, you evaluate your uh, SOC teams, and and so on. Um, uh, the issue usually is uh, like if you go back a few slides to that. To mm -hmm. the, Where to am I going to? To that curl slide, to the previous one. Uh, this yeah. one. Yeah. Sure. So. Um, Hackers are not going to execute a curl command. So the way they would do it is uh, they would 
look for a SSR of vulnerability or an RCE, and they will send a gadget. <laughs> so it will be the application that will be making a call to these metadata service and so on. So it, the, the traffic will, will appear as if it's coming from a legitimate microservice or an application. So how deeper can these tools go? Can they identify? So what, be more precise about the kind of attack that you're proposing that someone would be launching against. So for example, SSR of server-side request forgery. So I know an application accepts a URL endpoint and is going to open that endpoint. Right, so then I will pass the metadata as the, the, the parameter to that application. So this feels more like a question about the quality of where we have detections and high quality logging. So if, uh, say, the web app was only accessible through an endpoint that we controlled, then we could look at what commands were being run on that device, and we could therefore see, we could see the interesting looking command. That's one way we could pick this up. Uh, we could also have very good application logging uh, so that we were seeing HTTP requests incoming and we were logging everything in that sense. I think that might be a bit extra, but... Uh, and so in that scenario, then I guess how you might motivate, how you might use threat test to sort of better motivate uh, better detection in engineering would be to write a scenario that, as precisely as I said with a, with HTTP requests, uh, like sends an interesting looking HTTP request that, that qualifies as uh, SSRF or, I, I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, I think, I, I think yeah, I think okay. you're getting, getting there. Thank you. There's one more question here. Thanks. Yeah, I'm curious in practice, what kind of scale or volume you run these detonators at? I imagine you might anticipate issues where in this big long chain, your pipeline from the event through to the alert, you may have issues where some small fraction of events are lost due to timing issues or under load or something. Are you doing this once per day or are you doing like a, so, a large stream of these things all the time? Okay, so I'm gonna stress the first bullet point there, which is productionize. This, this, this isn't ready. <laughs> uh, but when it is, uh, I anticipate this being a nightly job that would run pretty early in the morning for um, for our security engineering team here. So it would maybe run like 5, 6 a.m. And it'll become part of the business as usual work for our uh, so-called interrupt or whoever our, our analyst of the day is to come in and review which tests are, are failing or which are succeeding. Uh, I don't know how large a suite will run, uh, but the issue that you were kind of touching on is that, you know, as I mentioned, this is a long old pipeline and, you know, any any interruption or any timeout on any stage could result in failure. Well, okay, if it failed then for the threat test, then it would fail for the real thing as well, which is a problem. So any any failure needs to be treated as an, as an issue. As for uh, how long uh, you would continue to poll for, that's a configurable parameter. Um, so you can actually see in here under the expectations for the first one and for the second one, actually. So you have one minute, 15 minutes. Depending on what kind of event you're triggering, it might take longer or less time for the alert to arrive. And that's a reasonable expectation. Like we don't have amazing SLAs from all of our log sources. So like some of them, some of them do take a while and we would be prepared to just wait. Like it's fine. Like the, the binary I envision uh, running as a cron job, uh, Kubernetes cron job uh, that will just, it'll wait for as long as I specify the timeout to be. And if that's an hour, I hope it's not, but if it is, then, you know, it's an hour. Uh, but that's more a question of like the SLAs associated with our log sources, really. And we kind of just, we take what we can get there. Thanks, Josh. We have one more question here at the back. Hey, man, uh, good talk. So assuming you get to productizing it, uh, producing it. So when you actually go live, uh, a part of precursor is then to work with the engineering teams to look at the thread models they have built and the reverse engineering of existing uh, models which you have to understand what could go wrong, the abuse cases and the misuse cases or the attack cases. I think that goes with what you're doing. Uh, yeah, that was not a question, but cool. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you have to say. Um, I, it would be good to uh, first motivate what we look for by assessing our components threat models and to use that to motivate what scenarios we choose to write in threat test and subsequently what detections we opt to build. 
and will work with teams to build suitable validation. Any more questions? No. No. Okay, let's thank George for a great talk. Thank you.